In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. So now it's uh, time to rebound if necessary. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now I got an email today, actually several emails, and the guy says, uh, I told you not to teach Matthew uh, because uh, Matthew deals with dispensations and uh, you're not qualified enough to even know all about it and you got Matthew chapter 5 all wrong. Well, no, I didn't. And I don't think the guy even listened to the message because he said, Matthew chapter 5 is concerning the millennium. I thought I made it very clear. And uh, I went back and listened to the message and I said, well, yes, uh, Matthew chapter 5 is uh, for the millennium. But it was also presented then to the disciples as well, and I guess that was his uh, sticking point. But it was presented to them because the millennium had to be presented before judgment could. So grace comes before judgment. And that was the principle. And, well, it's just uh, silliness. Some people are just uh, jackasses. So um, I've, got this, uh, I've got this article here. Uh, uh, it's from the Limbaugh letter. And um, I don't really much like to talk about politics from the pulpit, but uh, this is dealing with Christianity as well. So you might not agree with the politics of it, but that's fine. It, it, there's real no, no spiritual value. Uh, but the fact is, during the time of the scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, there were a lot of politics going on and a lot of uh, people vying for political power, uh, just the same as uh, we have uh, political parties today. So I'm going to read this. Some of it's a, a bit funny. On June 6, Democratic National Committee Chairman Howard Dean dismissed the Republicans as pretty much a white Christian party. Well, that's well, it probably pretty much is. Just two weeks before, Dean had told uh, Tim Russert on NBC's Meet the Press, I am a committed Christian. I pray every night. You either believe in the teachings of Jesus or you don't. I do. Like Dean, the Democrats have been schizophrenic about religion since the election. After exit polls showed that 60% of regular churchgoers backed Bush, the Democrat leadership alternated between resentful sneers at the religious right and attempts to close the God gap with uh, paroxysms of Bible quoting. Senator John Kerry claimed, I went back and reread the whole New Testament the other day. <laughs> House Minority Leader, big deal, but the other day, yeah, right. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, touting government spending, quoted Jesus, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. I guess they were trying to promote their welfare programs. Dean, who told an interviewer during the campaign that his favorite New Testament book is the Old Testament book of Job. <laughs> <laughs> he, he now declares, I saw in the Bible that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven which he says he didn't see in the Republican platform. We need to kick the money changers out of the temple and restore values in America again. Well, I'm not going to go on with this. Some of it's just laughable, uh, but uh, people are trying to use uh, a Jesus in politics to, to get ahead. And the fact is, the well, at least uh, well, a little less than half the country despises Christians, and that's alarming because... If they ever get into power, they will try to limit a free speech. And if uh, the other people were in power today and I got up here and taught Romans chapter 1 verse 11 and taught how homosexuality is a sin, uh, they might uh, convict me of a hate law or something. And that's the direction they would like to head. Uh, but now we're on, uh, we're on Matthew lesson number 11 and we're at Matthew chapter 5 verse 33. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. And just think, John Kerry read this uh, verse as well. But uh, I doubt he knew what it meant. Again, you have heard that it was said to a previous generation. Now, this is going to be the corrected translation throughout. I'm not going to give you the Greek because you don't know Greek any more than I do. But I know this is the uh, uh, correct, corrected uh, translation. Again, you have heard it that it was said to a previous generation. Never make a statement in the name of someone or something that is reliable. And the principle is, uh, don't make an oath uh, regarding something greater than yourself. And this is where people would say, I swear by God, I saw that airplane blow up in the middle of the air. And uh, that is part of, uh, well, what happens when you do that is you're making, well, we'll see, making it responsible for your statement. That's what you're doing. Uh, when you say, I swear by God, you are making God responsible for your statement. And that's what it says. Again, you have heard that it was said to a previous generation, never make a statement in the name of someone or something that is reliable, making it responsible for your statement. But you should always keep your word. In other words, you don't have to swear by anything. Just let your word be your word. Stand on your own integrity. And a lot of times, people will bamboozle you, as the Pharisees did. Uh, they would get into a business deal, and uh, they and uh, they would uh, say, uh, you'll make uh, $10,000 off of this, whatever they used back then. You'll make 10000 off of this. Join in business with me. And then they would say, I swear by God. And then they would go in the business deal and they, well, he swore by God and then they would lose all their money. So uh, you must stand on your own integrity and don't uh, make that statement. So really what he's doing is stepping all over the toes of the Pharisees, the religious nuts, because uh, they're always swearing by something because it makes them sound as if uh, uh, they have more, uh, well, they have more, what's the word, uh, well, they have a more uh, ability to seem responsible or to seem as if uh, they are more credible. That's the word, credible. But you should always keep your word. And then chapter 5, verse 34. But I say to you, do not make a promise with an oath at all. Not by heaven, because it is the throne of God. Not by earth, because it is his footstool. And not by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, because you are not able to make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. More than this is from the evil one. And what he's saying is the devil's been a liar from the beginning. And he always uh, comes up with lies, and he would do it very deceitfully. So the Pharisees, the religious people to whom Jesus was talking, he's saying, uh, look, you're being very deceptive. Uh, you know you might be lying to someone, but you come up and say, I swear by God Almighty, this is going to happen. I swear by God Almighty, uh, I will do thus and so. And usually when people have to swear on something, be a bit suspicious. Their yes should be yes and their no should be no. And so these people would uh, swear all the time concerning God, or I swear on my mother's grave, I'll do this, that, and the other thing. And I know we do it today, is it? but usually today it's more of a joke, but they did it back then all the time as a form of deception. Or, I swear by God, I'll pay you back next week. Next week rolls around and you don't see your money. So what he's saying is, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And the reason why he brings this up is because it's stepping all over the religious people. It's stepping all over the legalist. And they're sitting there thinking they're perfect, and he's just... Well, he knows all about them. And he's just, in verse after verse, bringing up things that they do that are incorrect. He's bringing up the fact, you're a bunch of deceitful creeps. And you go around acting holy, using your holy language, swearing by God. I swear by God. And you, you, you can imagine a halo hovering over their head. They're so holy. And Jesus is saying, no, you're not. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. You're a bunch of uh, gross people with sin natures like everyone else. Then in chapter 5, verse 38, it deals with the uh, fact of retaliation. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And of course they heard that. 
Well, they were Jews growing up. They heard all about the law, and they definitely heard about the uh, judicial proceedings in which uh, they would have an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you murder someone, well, the court will sentence you to capital punishment. So this is a judicial principle of law. But what Jesus is doing is he's bringing out the fact that uh, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, have distorted this. They went from saying, they, they took it out of its judicial context. This has a judicial context, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's a good principle. And it's a judicial principle. But the scribes, Pharisees, and the Sadducees had taken uh, this principle and turned it into uh, something else. They turned it into personal use for vengeance. And they say, that person insulted me. I will insult them back and destroy them. Well, that's a function of the sin nature. They distorted a judicial principle. This is how the court should function, not how you should function uh, in your life. So it was distorted by them. So then Jesus Christ slaps him upside the head again in 539. But I say to you, do not retaliate against the low-down evildoer, but whoever slaps. And he, use, he uses the word slaps because it's, a, well, it's something that the disciples would be very familiar with because uh, in the ancient world, uh, since the Roman Empire now occupied Israel, if they did not uh, bow down on their knees when someone, when some of the kings would enter into the city, they would be slapped into submission. And then if they still didn't uh, bow down, they would be slapped and punched even harder until finally if uh, you retaliated and attacked the police officer, as it were, uh, you would be killed. And so they understood this very well. So he would have his uh, bodyguards, that is the king, slap them for not bowing down to him. So he uses this so that they could understand it clearly. Then he goes on to say, But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him. Now, this does not authorize a pacifism. It doesn't authorize you to be stupid when it comes to self-defense either. Uh, this is just uh, talking about a mental attitude of grace, a mental attitude of divine love. In other words, using uh, what we know today is impersonal love. When someone uh, insults you, slanders you, does you wrong, use impersonal love. And you don't lower yourselves to their level you simply uh, work on the basis of your own integrity. So you won't lower yourself and you won't retaliate. And this is what Jesus is saying. And this slapped, uh, it, this was a slap in the face to the religious people too. Because every time someone would insult a religious person, they would turn around and insult them back. They would gossip, malign, and judge all day long. Uh, they really didn't see anything wrong with it because they had distorted a verse in the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. They, that person did me wrong. I will uh, retaliate in revenge. And remember, revenge is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Uh, but all the religious people said, uh, no, God, step aside. I'm going to repay. And so this stepped on their toes because he's saying, no, uh, you don't have a grace attitude. You don't have a grace mental attitude. Uh, you don't know how to use the fourth stage of the faith rest drill, which would be utilization of 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares on the Lord, for he cares for you. So when someone does you wrong, uh, cast them upon the Lord, and the Lord will deal with them. And retaliation lowers you to the level of the vindictive as well. Somebody insults you because they're a vindictive type person. If you insult them back, you also uh, become a vindictive type of person. If you're insulted by your enemy, if, or if you are gossiped about, leave them in the Lord's hands, and that's the principle. But we have to take principles from this because liberals, uh, def definitely uh, liberal theologians, have uh, misinterpreted this verse even to the point of disarmament. Uh, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. So when Osama bin Laden uh, blows up your buildings, well, just turn the other cheek like Jesus said. That is heresy. That's ridiculous. And this is not what Jesus means. If, uh, and so we'll take down some points. Point one, if someone attacks you and threatens your life and limb by doing so, you have the right of physical retaliation and self-defense. 
If someone comes in your house and invades your property and looks like they're going to steal something, you have the right to blow their head off. And Jesus is not saying, okay, thief, uh, take everything out of my house now because I am going to turn the other cheek and pay you no attention. This is not the principle. The principle is dealing with your personal relationships, uh, normal circumstances, such as your personal relationships at work. Someone does you wrong at work, leave them in the Lord's hands. Someone always will. There's always people around who will uh, nag at you and criticize you. Leave them in the Lord's hands and the Lord will take care of them. Uh, but this does not have to do uh, like uh, some liberals I know say, well, if someone were to smack me on the cheek, I would uh, let them smack me on the other cheek. He was being figurative. He wasn't saying you don't have a right to self-defense and to think so is to be an idiot. Verse uh, point two. In verse 39, Jesus Christ is emphasizing the mental attitude of impersonal love. He's emphasizing the mental attitude of impersonal love. And for them at that time, he was emphasizing the mental attitude of grace. They had to have grace orientation in which uh, they had their own integrity to stand on. So pretty much uh, 533 through 539, Jesus Christ is saying, stand on your own integrity. First of all, uh, don't make an oath. Uh, to someone else who is greater than you so that you can seem credible. Don't do that. Stand on your own integrity. And then in 538 through 539, stand on your own integrity. Don't destroy your integrity by reacting to someone else. Now remember, the audience here is uh, the disciples along with other uh, people there who may be religious. And also, this will be the upgraded Mosaic Law. You see, they had functioned under the Mosaic Law all the way up until this point. Now Jesus Christ is teaching the kingdom, the 1,000-year reign, the millennium. So I make it very clear, yes, he's teaching concerning the millennium. This is how they will function in the millennium. But he's also teaching to the audience that is there right then. I mean, he didn't go up to this audience and say, uh, don't do any of this, uh, wait till the millennium. They had no clue about the millennium except from Joel, and they knew that there would be one, but they didn't know that a church age would interrupt it. And you see, the age of Israel, when Jesus Christ was born, it was still the age of Israel. Now, we separate it out as the hypostatic union because Christ's birth was so important. But it's still the age of Israel. That's why Christ is talking about going up to an altar and slaughtering an animal because they're still functioning under the Old Testament laws. So it's still the age of Israel and he's functioning under that and actually fulfilling the law right now. And then the age of Israel is interrupted because in August of 70 AD they fall under the fifth cycle of discipline and that ends all Jewish client nations until the millennium. And then the tribulation resumes the age of Israel. So this is a break in the age of Israel, the church age. And so he was teaching to the disciples right here. And he is teaching also to the millennium, is teaching to the whole Jewish age, which has been interrupted by the church age. And all of that is uh, definitely a part of theology and has all been established and by by um, all the uh, doctrinal pastors and all those who have uh, dealt, delved into this, uh, such as Lewis Berry Schaefer, all of them know this. So, uh, point three, Jesus Christ himself was very tough. Jesus Christ himself was very tough and did not allow people to run over him. And when people would criticize our Lord, such as the uh, Pharisees and the religious people, he wouldn't let them get away with it. He wouldn't say, yeah, maybe you're right. He would come back dogmatically with doctrine and say, uh, you're a sinner. You think you're so great. Uh, you're all destined for hell unless you believe in me. And he would be very tough with them. And he was very tough when he overturned the money changers. Now, uh, you might think of Christ as uh, just always turning the other cheek and being very sweet and mild and meek. Well, he wasn't. And when uh, people were out of line, he was dogmatic and he let them know. He let them know to the point that they would get so irritated with his message and so irritated with him that they hung him on a cross. And uh, so he was tough. If he had been meek and mild, well, he wouldn't have offended so many people. 
But he had to be tough. You have to be tough when presenting the Word of God. Point four. So if you attack me physically, I will try to brutalize you the best I can. Point four. That's a joke. You don't have to write that down. But if anyone says, Pastor, you should turn the other cheek. I'm angry with you. I'll slap you on the face. No, uh, we will duel. And I might lose, but I'm not going to just lay down for you. And no one should. So if you are attacked, you have the right of self-defense. Chapter 5, verse 40. And if someone wants to sue you and take your shirt, also give him your coat. Now this principle deals with our relationship with the Lord as the basis for our happiness, not our possessions. He's simply saying is, uh, don't get so attached to your possessions. Uh, Don't think of your possessions as the end all. Happiness is with uh, the Lord. Happiness is in knowing doctrine. So if someone steals from you, don't have a mental attitude reaction and go into the sin nature. Uh, simply leave them in the Lord's hands and in fact have such a grace attitude go ahead and let them take your coat as well in other words you don't care you don't care about the things of the world or what you possess now you can also take that to an extreme of course prosecute someone who steals from you and Jesus Christ is not saying don't prosecute them so we'll have to take down two points for this to keep it clear point one if someone steals from you you will feel violated I've, I've had things stolen from me. And it's a, there's a feeling of violation. Someone took your property. For example, when I was in Texas, uh, some guy bashed out my wife's uh, window on her car and stole the radio. Well, it's a feeling of violation. That's your property. What are they doing? So you do feel violated. You feel as if you've been taken advantage of. And therefore, you might want to retaliate. And if I would have seen the guy doing it, there would have been definitely a a thing in which I would have definitely seen him do it, retaliate it. But just thinking about it, if I knew who that was, I would go and grab him by the hair and uh, beat him silly for doing that. But you see, this retaliation uh, gives you a thinking that is not of Christ. It's not the thinking of Christ. And what will happen, actually, you will obsess, perseverate on that. Someone steals from you, breaks into your house, you'll probably perseverate on that for a month until they're prosecuted and put in jail. And you still might perseverate on it and think, what a jerk he was disrupting my life. And you might constantly think about it when you should still be thinking about doctrine. And so what he's saying is, look, these things happen, relax, leave it in my hands. And of course, leave it in the hands of the law too. And don't become a vigilante. Just leave it in uh, my hands and leave it in the hands of the law. It'll all be taken care of. And uh, don't give it a second thought. You have a spiritual life to live. That's what he's saying. Point two, Christ tells us to give of our coats as a principle of describing a mental attitude of grace and also a mental attitude of realizing that happiness is not in what we possess. Happiness is not in what we possess. So if someone takes the car radio that you like to listen to, well, it's unfortunate, but you you don't get happy from a car radio anyway. You might be stimulated on occasion from a, a good song, but it's not your source of happiness. So in other words, uh, don't go on a mental attitude tangent in which you're uh, constantly worried about the situation or in which you are (coughs) not leaving it in the Lord's hands. Chapter 5, verse 41. This is the corrected translation, and it has to deal with uh, the custom in those days. And actually it says, whoever drafts, drafts as in the draft. This is the Greek word, Agaros, A-G-G-A-R-O-S. Whoever drafts. Now in those days, a Persian officer could uh, walk through Palestine where the Jews were living and he could uh, draft a civilian and use their horses to serve in the military for a year or two. For a year, actually. Uh, But what uh, Christ says is, he asks you to serve for a year, serve two. If you're drafted into this army, and you see it's a foreign army, so the the religious people hated that. They wanted their country back, and that's understandable. But Jesus is saying, look, 
You have such a mental attitude of hatred all the time. You're under the fourth cycle of discipline. This is how you have to live. And if you're drafted and they ask you to serve for a year, go ahead and give them two years. He's shocking them. They're always trying to revolt against the authorities. These Jews, these religious Jews, are always uh, trying to have civil disobedience. Well, they're under the fourth cycle of discipline, and they don't like it because under the law it says uh, you can't have a foreign ruler over you, and it does say that in the Old Testament. But they were cursed under the fourth cycle of discipline because of their uh, lack of knowledge of doctrine. So there wasn't a big enough pivot. And so Christ says, hey, these foreigners come up and draft you and ask you to serve a year. Instead of doing what you do and get uh, civil disobedience, you go ahead and serve for two years. It shocked them. You can see why they don't like our Lord, because he's uh, going against the grain of everything that they've grown up listening to. And just like a lot of people around here, they've grown up under legalism, and they hear something of grace, they're going to react to it. Just like the church sign I saw yesterday on Highway 24. It says, or not 24, it's 28. It says, alcohol and Satan are allies. Oh, really? Well, that's a statement of having no knowledge of the Word of God. Yet they think that. But they don't know the Word of God, so Jesus turned water into Satan's ally. Why? It, it makes no sense. It really, it, it shows a complete lack of knowledge of the Word of God. It's sad, really. It's disgusting. And so uh, Christ would come along and turn water into wine, and uh, those same people, they're just like the religious people back then. Those same people would say, oh, he turned it into wine. They probably wouldn't even be so shocked by the miracle. They would be more shocked by the fact it was alcohol. And they would say, that is of the devil. Only the devil would turn water into wine and the preachers would get up Sunday morning and be preaching about Jesus, the one who saved them, by the way. But maybe they're not even saved, just as these people weren't saved back then. Maybe they're just following a religious code. Maybe those people at that church, maybe 90% of them are just religious people, never been saved. Because I tell you what, if Jesus Christ were on the earth today, and he turned water into wine, and they saw his lifestyle of witnessing to prostitutes and having a social drink with the nefarious people. Of course, he never got drunk. The thought would be blasphemous. But he would have a social drink, uh, just a little bit of wine. And if they were to see that, and they were to see these miracles, they would say the same thing the religious people said. Oh, those miracles are from the devil, because the devil and alcohol are allies. And they too would have hung him on a cross. It's a sad thing, but the state of Israel at that time, I'm talking about their state as in about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline, it almost lines up exactly with the way the United States functions today. On the one hand, we have a bunch of religious people trying to outlaw everything, and then on the other hand, a bunch of antinomian people who go out and raise hell and never, get a never give a thought about God. We're in the same boat as Israel was. And so we, too, are in bad shape. So if someone takes your shirt, also give them your coat. That's what cloak means. And whoever drafts you, well, don't just serve them one year, which is required. Go ahead and serve them two years. And by way of application, if you're ever drafted because the United States has to go to war and uh, you are needed and your mother says, no, go to Canada, uh, you would be outside of God's will if you ran to Canada. And uh, uh, besides, if the United States is taken over, well, Canada goes to hell too. So uh, don't run to Canada and be a yellow-bellied coward. If they draft you, go. You have to. This is part of the mandate right here in 541 to join military service. And look, this was a foreign military service. And Jesus Christ said, go. You're drafted, go. And that's a principle of Scripture, definitely given in the Old Testament and one right here in the New Testament. If you're drafted by the United States Army or Air Force or whoever, go. You have to. And if you don't, you're outside of God's geographical will and you'll be a yellow-bellied coward and uh, you'll probably run to Canada. And then chapter 5, verse 42. Give to the one who asks you and do not reject the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, this is a mental attitude of grace. 
And a mental attitude of grace always results in generosity. And usually people with a mental attitude of grace, actually all the time people with a mental attitude of grace, are going to be generous people. Now it doesn't mean you get stupid and every bum you see on the street you don't have to fork out a hundred dollars to them. It just means that uh, you, you're, you're generous. And uh, for example, uh, this, might, this can apply when tipping at a restaurant. Now be generous. Give them a tip. They're hardly making anything anyway. And if you go to a restaurant, make sure you have enough extra money for a tip and be generous. They served you. Be generous with them. It's a mental attitude of grace. And actually, a mental attitude of grace would be generous to them even if they're not a good a waitress. And usually, I'm even a generous to the bad waitresses or waiters. Waiters don't get as much money from me. Only the uh, waitresses get more from me than waiters. But unless, <laughs> unless they're a good waiter, and then the, he, he'll get some uh, good money. So you must have a mental attitude of grace resulting in generosity. Now in chapter 5, verse 43, we have the dynamics of the grace life. And Jesus Christ is teaching grace because all of these religious people have always, uh, well, they don't know anything about grace. They're just sticklers for the law. And anyone who overtly breaks the law, uh, they'll chew them out or ostracize them from society and look down their noses at them, uh, just like the religious crowds around here and around the whole country do. If you don't act just the way you want them to act, they look down on you. And so in chapter 5, 43, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This is what the rabbis have been teaching. And they distorted it from the Mosaic law, saying eye for eye, tooth for tooth, using it in personal situations rather than for, for judicial matters. So the rabbis had been teaching this, and it wasn't part of the Mosaic law. And they were teaching this because at this time, Judah was under the shadow of the Romans. And they wanted all the people to hate the Romans. And the Romans were actually very kind to the Jews when they went under the fourth cycle. But they were so stubborn that they couldn't appreciate how much freedom the Romans had given them. Well, they gave them all of their religious freedom. And of course, uh, there were some things there that they didn't like, such as the worshiping of other gods and all of that. But the Romans had been very kind to the Jews up until a point because they were always rebellious. They were the hardest people for Rome to govern. And this was because the rabbis were always teaching hatred and civil disobedience. So hatred through religion for the Jews was their ultimate self-destructive tool. And just as today, the ultimate self-destructive tool of the Muslim is his religion. His religion teaches hate. His religion teaches hate against Jews first, Christians second. And so they try to kill us all the time. And they hate us so much they'll strap a bomb on them and blow themselves up and go to hell. And they think they're going to heaven for doing it or going to some place where they can have a all the free sex they want. How perverted a religion is that? They, they think of heaven as just a, a place of sex. It's crazy. And they are crazy. And all religion is crazy. And these religious Jews were crazy getting into civil disobedience, trying to overthrow the greatest empire ever seen. They didn't have a chance. They were so arrogant and so full of themselves, they thought that uh, through their religion and through the hatred of the Romans... And we'll see how they even hated very much tax collectors, which is funny because Matthew, the Levi, is a tax collector. Chapter 5, verse 44. But I say to you, keep on loving your enemies. You see, your enemies do not deserve your love. Not at all. They don't deserve it. But grace, remember, we don't deserve salvation. But grace doesn't depend on the nature of the enemy. All of us at the point of birth, become enemies of uh, Christ or enemies of God. We become enemies of God because uh, we uh, are, well, we don't have righteousness, the plus R imputed to us. Uh, but grace says it doesn't matter. I'll give you a solution. So grace doesn't depend on the nature of your enemy. It depends on who and what you are. And it's the same for impersonal love. 
Impersonal love depends on your integrity, not the integrity of the object. So this is a principle of impersonal love that we will uh, that will be used in the millennium, except it's a lower form. It's uh, more along the lines of grace orientation. Speak nicely about those who malign you. That's very difficult. Speak nicely about those who malign you. Keep doing good to those who hate you and pray for those who persecute you. So you must operate, in this case, under the fourth stage of the faith rest drill. When someone persecutes you, do not retaliate. When someone calls you a slut because of the way you dress, don't retaliate by trying to destroy them. Leave them in the Lord's hands. Do not retaliate. Do not gossip about them. Do not malign them. Do not judge them. This is a principle of grace, a principle that obviously insulted the religious crowd. That's all the religious crowd did was uh, talk about other people so that it would make them feel better about themselves. I'm so holy, and that person is not because that person does X, Y, and Z. And then they go into prayer and say, uh, I thank you, God, that you did not make me like someone else who does X, Y, and Z. Yet they're doing the worst of the sins. So he was stepping all over their toes. He's saying, look, uh, you're always maligning, gossiping, and judging about people. What you should do is speak nicely about those who malign you. So they're just vibrating with hatred toward our Lord. Chapter 5, verse 45. So that you may become the obvious sons of your Father in heaven. This is the corrected translation. It doesn't mean so that you will become the sons. It doesn't mean that if you do not malign, if you do not gossip, and if you do not judge, that you will go to heaven. What it's saying is, if you uh, do not do these things, you will become the obvious sons of your Father in heaven. Obvious to those who uh, can see that and see that you don't gossip, malign, and judge. It becomes obvious that you're a child of God. It becomes obvious that you're a believer, in other words. So this is an uh, illustration of the Father's grace. When you uh, have grace orientation, you are actually illustrating and showing the world a God the Father's grace. Since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the saved and the unsaved. That's God's grace. Logistical grace support uh, given to believers, also unbelievers. Hitler, a very, very evil man, could drink water. He could eat. He could do all the things that we do. And the sun rose over the Nazi empire just like it rises over the United States. So uh, God uh, gives a grace even to the unsaved. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do that. Or the tax collectors do that too. And there's some humor in that when Matthew writes this because he's a Levi. I'm not a Levi. Well, he's a Matthew, the tax collector. The Levi, who is a tax collector. So he's probably listening to this and he gets a chuckle out of it when Christ says, well, even the tax collectors do that. You see, there's a bunch of religious people there who look down their noses at the tax collectors because, well, they're hated. They, look at, they looked at the tax collector back then as a traitor because the tax collector would often be a Jew and the Jew would have to collect taxes from their fellow Jews to send it to Caesar. Well, they didn't want to send any money to Rome. They didn't consider themselves Romans. Now, Rome had, had the ability, until they got hold of Israel, Rome had the ability to incorporate everybody as a Roman. And once they were conquered, they were very effective at getting them to pay their taxes. They were very effective at actually uh, creating in them some pride in being a Roman. Well, they would take over some lands and uh, they would never consider themselves Greeks anymore. Uh, they would say, I am a member of the Roman Empire. And they felt good about it because they were a member of the greatest nation on the earth. And they were proud of it. But the Jews never got to that point. And they would not assimilate into the Roman Empire. Thus, they were eventually destroyed and scattered throughout the earth, all of which was prophesied earlier. So he says, even the tax collectors do that. So everybody looks at Matthew, the tax collector, as a traitor. 
He's a, a fellow Jew going around collecting taxes from fellow Jews. And oftentimes, some of the tax collectors would skim a little off the top for themselves and enrich themselves. So they became an, actually an object of envy because they made such easy money and also an object of hatred because, well, they represented the Roman Empire. They represented their fourth cycle of discipline. And so they naturally uh, disliked the tax collectors. So he's telling them, you're no better than a tax collector. You say, uh, do good to those who do you good and do evil to those who do you harm. Even the tax collectors do that. And they've always looked down at the tax collector. So to put it in our terms, uh, if I was uh, teaching that church that said alcohol and the Satan are allies, I would say uh, something uh, to the effect of, uh, well, even alcoholics do that. Love those who love you and hate those who hate you. You say, well, even an alcoholic can do that. And that would then they would understand it. And they would say, you are insulting me. You're telling me that I'm just as bad as an alcoholic? And Jesus would say, worse than. And that's what he's bringing out. So the tax collectors do that. And I could almost see Jesus smiling when he says that. <laughs> smiling at Matthew. Even the tax collectors do that. Because Matthew knew what was going on. Don't they? Chapter 5, verse 47. And if you only greet your brothers... What more do you do? The, Gentile, the Gentiles do that, don't they? So he insults them again. The worst thing that a Jew could be called is a Gentile. They had a lot of racial pride. And the worst thing you could do is go up to a Jew and say, You Gentile. It would be like a calling them a cuss word. Worse than calling them a cuss word. It would be like uh, just uh, lambasting them with every uh, dirty word in the English language. They, they hated Gentiles. They thought they were greater than Gentiles. So uh, what Jesus is saying, oh, so uh, you love uh, someone because they love you and you hate someone because they hate you? Yeah, you're just like a Gentile. The Gentiles do that, don't they? So it's another insult. So you can see why uh, Jesus wasn't too liked. Chapter 5, verse 48. So then, you will be perfect. This is, a, this is a sarcasm. It doesn't mean they will be perfect. What he's saying is, uh, here you are uh, thinking you're going to heaven by following the Mosaic Law, and you think of yourselves as being perfect little goody two-shoes. Well, uh, you love because they love you and you hate because they hate you. Even the Gentiles do that. Even the tax collectors do that. So then, you will be perfect if you follow these mandates. So they realize, sitting there, that they haven't followed these mandates. So what Christ is saying is, you aren't perfect. You're not going to heaven by all of these uh, good things that you think you've done because uh, you're just as bad as a Gentile. You're just as bad as a tax collector. Insulting, really. But they needed it because uh, people who think they're perfect don't think they need a savior. So he has to bring out the fact, and he's been doing this over and over again throughout this early part of Matthew, teaching them that they're sinners. You're all sinners. You need a savior. Uh, they think of themselves as not being sick. And people who aren't sick don't need a doctor. And that comes out later. So again, Christ is pointing out to all of them sitting there that they are sinners, just like the tax collectors and just like the Gentiles. Because many of the self-righteous had to figure out that they were sinners before they could uh, see their Savior. So none of the scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites ever were gracious toward anyone. Here's Christ teaching grace principles. That's foreign to them. They've never been gracious. What they do is heap up heavy burdens upon everyone. You must do this. You must do that. And when they fall under that heavy burden, instead of giving them a helping hand, they mock them. They laugh at them. They gossip about them. Oh, that person committed adultery. Or that person, and they even went so far and got so picky. Or that person didn't wash their hands before they ate. They are hellbound. That's how they were. They're just like the church down the street. That person drank alcohol. I saw them go to a restaurant 
and they were in the smoking section. And they ordered a glass of wine. Can you believe that? That's how they acted, just the way they act today. Well, who cares? The religious people care. And so Jesus would come along and say, yeah, well, you're just like them when you uh, gossip, malign, and judge. So he would insult them. So he was hated, believe me. So the next uh, part that we're going to see in chapter 6 is motivation in service. And when we get to this, the motivation in service, that is in uh, Christian service, uh, he really, really gets on their nerves because their motivation is all wrong, and we'll see that. So the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was overt. It was hypocritical, it was legalistic, and very religious. And this righteousness was condemned by Jesus in Matthew 23. So it sponsors... So what uh, this does, it, uh, what they do is they say, you must be religious, you must be legalistic, you must be hypocritical, and, and that's the way you receive salvation, by being just like we are, a bunch of hypocritical buttholes. And if you do that, you'll be saved. But this righteousness was condemned. And so Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he's telling them, look, disciples, you cannot uh, operate under this self-righteousness. And at the same time, serve me. You can't be like these scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites and serve me. This righteousness uh, sub substitutes religion for regeneration and the social gospel for the biblical gospel. And uh, the Catholic Church gets involved in the social gospel. If you feed the poor, if you uh, go out and do all of these religious works uh, in the name of the Lord then you'll be saved. And this is the social gospel. And also the social gospel uh, gets involved with uh, liberalism, uh, just like in that article. Let me bring that back out to let you know what the social gospel is all about. The social gospel, this is what uh, one of the Democrats, Democrats was uh, talking about. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, touting government spending, quoted Jesus. And as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Well, she is touting social gospel. We'll help the poor. As much as we help the poor with all of our government spending, which is nothing but our tax dollars being stolen from us, and they spend it on our charity. Charity should be free will. It shouldn't be forced upon us by government. But our government does that. And so she says, uh, since I'm a politician and have stolen your money and given it to the poor, I'm following in Jesus' footsteps. Well, she's, she's following the social gospel. That's not the true gospel. She probably doesn't know the true gospel. The true gospel is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But instead, they go in for social gospel. Feed the poor, help the poor. Nothing wrong with helping the poor, by the way. Nothing wrong with giving, giving to the Salvation Army. Nothing wrong with giving to some of the charitable or organizations that help the poor. And nothing wrong with it, but that's all they taught was a social gospel. And now it's incorporated into government. But we must uh, all follow the biblical gospel. And then also here we have the principle of giving. And in this case, it will be the first of three cases used to castigate self-righteousness. It will be the first of three cases to castigate hypocrisy. And also putting on a phony front. And it's the phony front operation, and that's what uh, most people get involved in today. It's no different today. It's just uh, about 2,000 years later. That's the only difference. So chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful about making a parade of human righteousness in order to be seen by people. This is approbation lust. They want to have the approval of people. So they act holy. They have a certain dress in which uh, people can pick them out. And, oh, he dresses holy. And they have a certain uh, vocabulary. God bless you, brother. Amen. Hallelujah. And they use this language all the time in order to be seen by people. And they want to get patted on the back. 
Or the lady in the church acts very, very sweet. And she acts very kind toward everyone. And so everybody looks at this sweet lady and says, she must be very righteous. Yes, she's very self-righteous. And I guarantee you, the first time the pastor gets up and steps on her toes, she'll turn into a demon in about one second. She'll go from smiling and being all uh, nice and sweet to ripping apart the pastor because she got her toes stepped on. So be careful about making a parade of human righteousness in order to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward from the immediate source of your Father in heaven. This is talking about temporal rewards. And remember, uh, this is uh, going to a, Jew, uh, a Jewish audience. They're Gentiles there as well. But it's the age of Israel, and the audience for Matthew is the Jew. Thus, whenever you give charitably, which you should, and it's fine. Thus, whenever you give charitably, do not sound a trumpet. Do, do, do. I'm coming to save the day. And they think very highly of themselves, sounding a trumpet. That's what religious people do. Look at me and what I do. And now I've seen this happen in churches. They say, uh, one guy got up one time, the Lord has laid it on my heart that today this church is going to raise $2,000. And then they started bidding uh, like a bunch of people at an auction. I give 500 And then that person looks at him and says, uh-uh. You're not out giving me. I give a thousand. And they're like they're at an auction uh, competing for being the most uh, righteous in their giving. Uh, f completely disregarding Scripture. Completely disregarding what Christ tells us in Matthew chapter 6. Yet these churches function this way. Where, where are they getting their information? Not from Scripture. So they all raise their hands and make a big deal about how they tithe. And I've heard people do that even where I worked. Oh, I got blessed this week because uh, this week I tithed at the church. It's all a big, a, a big show. It's not a big show and Jesus Christ makes it clear. Don't sound the trumpet. Don't go to work and, oh, I tithe this week. Aren't I great? No, you're an idiot. You just lost 10% of your income for nothing. That's all they've done. So, thus, whenever you give charitably, do not sound a trumpet as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on streets for the praise of men. And by the way, that church that I unfortunately was at, God had laid it on his heart that they would raise a 2,000, but they raised much more than that. So he should have gave the other back and said, God, didn't, God did not put that on my heart. But no, you can imagine they didn't do that. They said, oh, look at that. Praise God and all of that nonsense. See, it's all a show. And why, why do pastors have to get up and wiggle their voice? Praise God. Why did they go through all that? Well, it's an appearance of righteousness. It's not true righteousness. They're tr appearing righteous. And they're, well, they are, uh, they are tombs, whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. And some of these pastors that get up and sound like that aren't even saved. They're just preaching social gospel or preaching a religion. Do this, do that, and you'll be saved. Or when you're saved, you'll stop drinking, smoking, and chewing tobacco or whatever you do that they don't like you doing. Thus, whenever you give charitably, do not sound a trumpet as the religious hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets for the praise of men, approbation lust, approval lust. So believe me, if there were any religious people in Jesus' audience, and there were, believe me, they are vibrating by this time. There is sweat on their brow. Their fists are itching to punch him because he's, uh, he's showing a mirror to them. They've always looked in the mirror and saw something very beautiful and something very great and something that God is very proud of. And Jesus Christ holds up a mirror and the only thing they can see is a monster, which is what they were, monsters. So it irritates them. They don't like it. Now a few of them finally realized, he's right. I am a sinner. 
I have been very self-righteous. I will believe in Christ. A few did. Most of them couldn't come to it because they were just so angry. They probably broke out in hives or something. So then we have uh, chapter 6, verse 3. Well, I didn't finish that. I tell you the truth. They have received full payment. Or they have uh, truly received their reward. But what reward is that? The praise of man. They've received the approval of man. Big deal. It's meaningless when they're burning in hell right now, as many of them are. And they're burning in hell, believe me, they could care less about the praise of man. But then that's all they wanted, the praise of man. Well, surely they got that. Whoop-de-doo. Who wants the praise of reprobate man? But when you do your charitable giving, do not be motivated by your ego lust pattern. That's the corrected translation. These people were motivated by their ego. So Christ is telling them, you're a bunch of arrogant SOBs. You have inflated egos. You go out in the street and, uh, or you go up and you pray in public and you're real loud about it and you do it with repetition and also uh, you go out and give money and you do it so that men will pat you on the back. Surely you already have your reward. Verse 3, But when you do your charitable giving, do not be motivated by your ego lust pattern. Then in verse 4, So that your gift may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. So when you give, you give as unto the Lord, just like you should do everything as unto the Lord. When you work, you should work as unto the Lord. When, uh, when your mother tells you to come home, you should come home as unto the Lord. Uh, just as if the Lord himself had called you on the phone and said, Go home. <laughs> Get up and go. Do it as unto the Lord. And that's what that means. So, and now in chapter 6, verse 5, we'll get to this tomorrow night. And this is where we deal with prayer and how people uh, get up and pray in order to receive the praise of man. So with your ha heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of your word. Uh, may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things and make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And we pray for our president during this worldwide war. We pray that you will give him wisdom and we pray that you will confuse the counsel of our enemies. And if it be your will, continue to shield us from the sword of the terrorist. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.